Hi everyone, I'm Jody Nelson. I am curating the experience called Beyond an Inconvenient Truth. And during this curator conversation, I am so happy and I'm so pleased that we get to speak to Jody Sperling. She is one of the artists participating in the event and she's also an earth creative artist. So today we're talking in March, today's March 23, and I found her out in California. She is an artist that lives and works in New York City, but she's in California on her way to a residency in Alaska. So we're gonna start out today asking her a little bit about that residency and this project she has going on. And um, I'd really love to know how important residencies are for you. Um, great, thank you, Jody. It's uh, great to talk to you, and I'm really excited to um, have my work be included in this exhibition, and also to be part of the Earth um, Creative Collective. I think um, right now artists are in a place to really amplify um, the message that the scientists are getting out there that we are living in a very perilous time, and I think when we band together, our voice is louder and we have a broader impact. So I am grateful for this opportunity to help um, in this process of confronting these hard truths, but also mm -hmm. like really spending some time visioning um, more positive, hopeful futures and motivating ourselves to take the actions to get to these beautiful places that we can imagine and that are attainable, that we, we can do this. And we so can. that's part of that's part of what this um, work of art is about. It's really opening up our imagination to possibilities. Wow. And your work is so inspiring. <laughs> I have seen for those who haven't seen the, the, the performances yet, you will come to the come to the event and we'll be able to post them uh, some snippets online for you to take a look at. But what we're what I'm most interested in in this is this line quality that she's able to produce in performances. I mean, I've watched dance shows on TV. You know, I, I watch So You Think You Can Dance. I watch J Lo's World of Dance, and they they speak of the human lines that these dancers are able to do. But um, what are you going to work on when you go up to Alaska? Oh, sure. Okay, so we got a few bunch of questions here about residencies, what we're doing in Alaska, line yes. quality, all of it. So I guess I'll start talking with, um, going back to your question of the residency, I have an ongoing collaboration with really extraordinary composer named Matthew Bertner. And um, I encountered him uh, through a project that I did on a different residency. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that because it relates to Ice Flow, which is the piece we have in the gallery. So in 2014, I was invited to participate in a polar science mission to the Arctic. And basically, it was uh, Dr. Robert Pickert of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And it's uh, he's a very well renowned uh, scientist. Um, who studies, um, you know, the physical oceanography. And he had wow. a, a mission um, that was a collaborative mission with a number of different scientists to study um, this area around the, in the Chukchi Sea where there's uh, uh, really interesting things were happening. And so this was an interdisciplinary research study with scientists who were studying, um, you know, Dr. Picker was the... Uh, physical oceanography, which is the hydraulics and, you know, the upwelling, the people studying, um, you know, what's in the water, the life in the water, the algae and the, you know, the phytoplankton. And then there were people studying the ice and the sea ice composi composition. There were people studying the mathematics of the ice. And then there were even people studying the atmosphere, people studying the sediments and the mud. And then they had the choreographer. Uh. <laughs> they had it. He had an outreach team of it was a climate science uh, communication team. And so I was there, there was a, a photographer who documented the, um, there was a radio documentarian as well, um, and who also did video, it was a writer, and we had a blog for this uh, mission, it was called uh, Sub Ice 2014. And 
they brought me because I was interested in doing a dance work that related to the ice. And while I was there, I, you know, we were, it was a 43 day mission and it was a, I said, and we talked about the importance of residencies. I was there soaking up the science, yeah. <laughs> learning about sea ice, uh, even participating in some of the data collection. They had a, you know, observation where I would, uh, you know, every two hours, somebody from the science party would go on the deck and just do a visual. What what ice are we seeing out here? What kind of ice? How thick is it? And so I learned all the kind of technical terms for how to describe um, sea ice, the different types of it, the thickness of it. And this is a region where, you know, the ice on average was about, you know, 1.5 meters thick. But, you know, in decades past, it had been 20 meters thick. And now this is a region where if you see in the film, I'm dancing on this ice and it looks yeah. like it's land. It's just, you know, as far as you can see in every direction. Now the ice in this region is, um, you know, it's very sketchy. So, uh, I you know, it's tell you, when I saw you dancing out there. I, I mean, I've worked with a lot of artists. I've worked with a lot of different interdisciplinaries a lot of different media. I had to question it. I said to myself, is this Photoshop? Like, what is this? I, because there was an emotional response that was so high, I was so riveted. I had to know everything about what you were doing and where it was and everything. So you were able to go so in. What, and what go yeah. So the way it was created was, um, so the, the background is that I often work with these larger, than life costumes. And this comes from a historical perspective. And it does relate to your question of line. It was called uh, Serpentine Dancing. It was created by this woman, Loie Fuller, who was a famous artist who from the 1890s to the 1920s uh, danced in these very large uh, costumes that made of hundreds of yards of silk. And what I've been doing is taking this genre she created over 100 years ago and then putting it into environmental context. And the painting on the fabric um, was based on a photograph of pack ice. So ice in its form formative stages in the same region. It was taken on the same the photograph was taken on that ship the, you know, the year prior to me going. And I had a, a visual artist who's a textile artist paint the costume with this pattern so that when I move in this in uh, on the ice, it, what you're seeing is almost like a time lapse of the ice formation. And what was amazing was in terms of the process of me on the ship is that I was considered another researcher. And I wanna say there's this real simpatico between artists and scientists because artists are researchers and we're looking to sort of, you know, maybe test the hypothesis and do a little experimentation and then we hit on something, we get a theory and then we kind of publish, right? You know, yes. and and yes. so we're in search of truth the way that scientists are in search of truth. And what I was able to do is each time that the ice scientists would go down and study and drill holes in the, in the ice sheet and see how thick it was and analyze the properties, uh, they would let me go down as well and they would create a little area for me. And even that, you know, every time they had a, you know, what was called an ice station, they would map it out and be like, this is, you know, uh, this research team and this is, you know, for this other research team. And here's the dance research area, you know, and it was it was very official <laughs> and also ad hoc at the same time. And everybody helped me, you know, the whole crew chipped in with, uh, you know, sometimes people who weren't. Um, familiar with camera work, you know, they helped film it and they helped get me gear I needed and, you know, help carry my stuff down. So it was very collaborative between the crew of the Healy, it was the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Healy, the very large ship, and then the scientists who maybe they weren't doing the ice work, so they had time at that on those hours. And then the outreach team that edited this video on the ship, so it was just all done then and there. And then you know, we made this short film and it was really, I feel like it distilled the essence of what my experience was. Um, you know, we I ended up dancing on the ice 12 times in this course of this mission. Wow. And there were only, we only used the footage from two of the days when it was sunny, you know, and the other days it was 
just to give you an idea of what it's really like in this region, it's often the sky is white, the ice is white, and the only thing that's really important is the horizon. And the so, line, the line. Yeah, the line, yes. All, so this horizon, it, so here's what happened. So when I was there, part I had multiple outcomes. Uh, and one of the things that I wanted to do was not just make this little film, but also to research ice to make a larger theater piece and essentially transport this place to the stage. And when I wanted to, I wanted to find a composer who understood sea ice, who really knew about uh, what was going on. And I did, you know, a little Google search and I immediately came upon Matthew Bertner's website. And I, I was like, within seconds, I was like, this is the person that I need to collaborate with. And he is a composer who specializes in music of ice and snow. He uses, uh, he grew up in the far north of Alaska. Um, and uh, it's really shaped how he thinks about sound. And so he has this beautiful description of him as a, a listener of wind and ice mm. and a farmer of noise. And, uh, you know, and he creates um, a music uh, with principles of what's called eco acoustics. So ecoacoustics is a, a both a a form of music composition and also it's something that's used in science uh, where people listen to the properties of natural system. They use this acoustic information either you know for science or design or for composition for music composition. And so he makes music that is climate change music, recording glaciers. Um, you know, listening to um, uh, winds, uh, listening, you know, recording sounds underwater, and then filtering that information through that data through harmonic systems um, to sort of conjure up music that captures the syntax of the environment. And so together, so I told, I introduced him, uh, myself to him, and we, it was uh, really a uh, wonderful collaboration we did. Our first project was Ice Cycle. Good for you was, for just following that passion and just calling him. Yeah, I was. Well, I emailed him because I wanted to order his music and, and you know, down. And I didn't realize I was ordering the scores, not the uh, actual recordings. And so I had a little technical glitch. So I, you know, I thought it was just like a website. So it's like, you know, and he 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 emailed me back in like five minutes. Oh, my God. You're, it's amazing. You know, like. Because <laughs> he Jody's tells me thrilling. like he tells me like if you you know if you're doing music of ice and snow and then was like oh I you know like it's it's a small field yes you know? yes so we the here's so that was the beginning of a very long collaboration so we've done since then we did a project called Wind Rose that was about um, atmospheric change and the, and looking at how wind is changing and also how we can generate when we perform how we can generate wind like air currents and like think about making dance that's not just this. So this is the question of line quality to me is almost like line is two dimensional. And I think when we think about dance, I really encourage everyone to think and perceive three dimensionally. So beyond line, you know, and because often uh, dancers were trying to be pretty and we're trying to fit, you know, make this like line that's very clean, but real in nature, you never see a straight line you know, I mean, that it's like it's a straight line up right to the, you know, reaching for the sun. If you're, a, a you know, photosynthesis, but something gets in the way and you're going to go around it to go up, you know. And yes. and so I'm interested in um, I'm really per interested in spirals. I'm interested in fractal formations. Um, a lot of my choreography, like we use fractal patterning. So with Matthew, we did this piece on ice. We did this piece relating to wind. We did a piece relating to fractals we've um that was filmed for a documentary about Louis Fuller actually that should come out this year mm -hmm. then we've did a piece during the pandemic on plastic pollution um and um and now we're working on a piece about tree ecology um so this is like this t almost we started working in 2014 so almost 10 years not quite of this collaboration and so the residency is um basically he's an artist in resident at the Anchorage Museum in Alaska and I am going up there to work with him on our next project 
and then we will share our process in a kind of um, lectern at the museum, like a performance of some of our works together and a little piece of maybe something new that will develop. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I also just want to say one other thing, which is that Matthew has really inspired me because, and this is the great thing about any kind of collaboration, it's when you work with somebody and what they do just allows what you do to have its fullest form. And that, you know, it's, I, I even said to him, it's almost like the music is like a house, you know, and it's like dance really can't be better than the music, you know, it's just like, and the, it lives in the house of the the music. That's the a metaphor I was thinking about. But so he inspired me with this. I, I was thinking about ecoacoustics and I've been really wrapping my mind around what is a dance equivalent of that. What is a dance equivalent to ecoacoustics? So I have created a inquiry that's an ongoing inquiry for the last couple of few years. And I've been thinking and I've called it ecokinetics. And to me, ecokinetics is a way of relating human movement to natural systems and to thinking about how can um, with my body and with with other humans, how can we really um move in a way that helps us understand the natural world the world that we live in better and that's that's what i've been thinking about so it's not the same as ecoacoustics um but there is this uh and there is a kind of techno technology element to it right because it has to do with recording and listening but not only through recording devices also with the body right like thinking and observing yeah. and maybe like synthesizing some data um but then how do we how do we reflect that um, environment in, you know, and it can be on stage, like thinking about like, OK, this is, um, you know, ice forming. This is the horizon, right? Like, you know, we have a section of the dance, you know, where there's um, where I took this movement that I made up on the Arctic. That's oh. not in the film that you see. OK, but I can I can share that with you later. People can find it on my Insta feed. <laughs> OK, perfect. perfect. Yeah. And so it's where I, this sense where I was dancing and I felt the horizon and I began to dance in and around the horizon, feeling it rise and fall and stretch and lengthen and what that did to you know my body. and. And the sense of almost being like a camouflage with this white and and so then yeah I took I gotta, that exact movement yeah and I set it on a dancer and we did that in one moment of ice cycles the horizon dance I would love to see that I need to go to your feet to see that because as you were talking about your movements and your inspirations and getting there I was what was happening in my mind was that you were like the emotional truth. In addition to all the uh, scientific data and truth and those things, but to me, when I first saw your your choreography and your performance, I was thinking, "Wow, this is an emotional response to what she's in experiencing, what she's reading." But now, further as we talk about this, it's you are, you know, our we are made up of emotional responses, but our heartbeat is still, you know, this electric beat and it's almost like you're it when you describe it i was like oh my god you're having a kinetic experience with the horizon line that's it that's exactly it i think it's very as humans we get a little too caught up in emotion sometimes and when you connect on a more like visceral physical physiological yes. you know level it frees you from this kind of constant wave of like emotions and i think we need that kind of like um you know to engage with climate we have to it's not that we want to detach we want to feel an emotional pull but i often feel like i'm not necessarily having an emotional experience when i perform or even requiring you to have an emotional experience i'm creating a physical experience inviting you to participate in an experience of that physical experience and that may um trigger emotions for you but it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna affect people differently and then it has to have that openness otherwise it's too controlling you know of a um you know a, i'm telling you how like how to feel you know and i'm not telling you how to feel 
I'm just, I'm helping you. I'm not telling you how to feel emotionally. I'm telling, I'm giving you a sensation, you know? Yes, absolutely. That, absolutely. And that's like, that's what, or at least that's what I, you know, aspire to do. So I guess I should talk because the other piece in the, I talked a little bit about how ISLO came to be the other piece. Um, and that, you know, was a number of years ago. So I was 2014 when I was in that place. And I came back from the Arctic. I wanted to, you know, I live in New York City. Yeah. And I wanted to make dances that related to New York. I Not just like, uh, you know, I wanted to, you know, for a couple of years, I was like sharing this. Bring, I actually had a uh, program, Bringing the Arctic Home, because literally I felt like I was sharing it, right? But then yeah. I'm also like, you know what? You don't have to, you can see the climate change happening there because the ice is melting under your feet. But in New York, you know, it's, it's happening everywhere. So how do we wake this up? So we've done a lot of street activations and starting before the pandemic, we started performing on a, there's a day called Parking Day which is a day when people take over parking spaces yeah. and turn them into public places. Okay. And we put on a dance festival in four parking spaces on Broadway. And on it was Broadway. on Broadway. Yeah. And just okay. like you realize that in this little space of land that we are allowing people to store their, you know, fossil burning, you know, uh, vehicles for free on public, you know, unseated land, whatever, like, in that little stretch of land, we also could have a joyful community experience in just like a few feet, a few yep. square feet, you know. So we started to do that in um, our first one was in 2018. And then through the pandemic, this became a a way like the, with, with open streets, not just parking spaces, but also the whole streets. We were open them to pedestrians in New York City. So I had been planning to do a stage work about plastic. And then the city got shut down. And I had, you know, basically 150 plastic bags, you know, that had been accumulated by myself, by friends and family over the years. And we made a, you know, I made a costume and I began to explore in different environments, both in the city and in the country. Uh, who is this plastic being? You know, and I realized that she is generative, but, you know, that it, it became multi-layered because you see a heap of bags on the street, right? And yeah. it's garbage. Yeah. Right. And, but what if there's a person in there? Well, you know, yeah. What if that's a person? And, and we treat people, we see people on the street all the time and we treat them like garbage. And so it's just like inhabiting this place of, you know, basically, um, you know, how we throw things away and we throw people away. And then in the in the film, it was almost spontaneous when we were shooting it. And, you know, at the time, the, the I hadn't, we were shooting, I shot this in May of 2020. So we're still in this like strict lockdown. I'm wearing masks. The woman who's shooting me is wearing a mask. We're outside. She's got gloves on. She shot it on her iPhone, my iPhone 6. So it's not even like, you know... <laughs> And she's a new, you know, was a news producer. So she's like, you know, it was, anyway, but so we did this thing and I realized there's this fast fashion store. It was right in front of Urban Outfitters. And I was like, what if this person is like looking in this store and there are these models like with these clothes that are made by, you know, um, yeah. in very unsustainable ways with unfair labor practices and yet you know and it's cheap and it and it becomes landfill and so it's just sort of this moment where I'm like looking into the store desiring these clothes that you know are not plastic bags and here I am like covered in plastic bags rolling on the street and it's like I it's like I was born of the I mean this is the the uh indigenous uh being to this stretch of 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 um asphalt you know then, yeah concrete jungle yeah yeah i mean of course i i want to say that and there you know it's like there are indigenous people to this neighborhood uh but how we have treated this land this kind this creature is like you know the kind of uh has sprouted it's like that weed from the cracks yeah yeah and what i found what i found that i was trapped by oh by the way there's a bald eagle flying outside my window right now 
Love it. Oh my God. <laughs> um, wow. Well, uh, is that you created so much secular motion with plastic bags and the way that you moved. I mean, it seemed so rounded and always circulating. Well, it's funny. I'm thinking about plastic bags. They're just like incredibly, like when you put them together, they're just beautiful, like in a yeah. way that's surprising, right? Because like, and they make this sound that's crazy because it's like, you know, it's, and we've turned this piece, like this piece has now gone into become a stage work. We've done it on the street as a performance with three dancers and then, and then five, and we're doing it over Earth Day weekend, you know, for other dancers. And then it's turned into a, st a stage show, you know, or like per, uh, work and with five dancers and each one has their own kind of costume. And what was so interesting is during the pandemic, we were working at, I did this film and this is like, you know, uh, how I often work is I'll hub around a theme. So it's like with Ice Cycle, we did this little film and then we did the stage work about mm -hmm. ice. And um, here with this plastic piece, I did this, you know, film with a, and then I did, then we made a group film where each of, we were, the dancers were all in their different, you know, they had all left the city except for the one who was from Japan who stayed in New York, you know, <laughs> and everyone was zooming and we were having these zoom rehearsals and we tried to and we made it another film which is not in this show but uh you know maybe the next one i'll i'll share it with you where each of the dancers made some kind of plastic thing we all had plastic wherever we were and we had plastic it, yes. it tied us together and you realize okay it's everywhere we inhale it yeah like we're inhaling microplastics we're ingesting a credit card of plastic a week Oh, you know, I know, really? Yeah. I learned so much. My world, I don't, it's, I learned so much from art and artists. Yeah. I never learned, I never knew that one. You know what? Um, you, we have, I need to have a whole nother conversation with you because I would love <laughs> to talk about eco feminism with you, especially when you're, oh, yeah. Like how much we're, yeah, we need to have a whole nother one. But, and before we end, I just want to say thank you so very much for all of your energy and all of your creativity in general and being able to collaborate with, with Earth Creative. I just can't thank you enough because as you said in the beginning, yes, when we speak together as a community, our voice is then louder and we can amplify it. Um, but before we go, where what's your Instagram for everybody that's going to watch this so they can go find you? Okay, there's a few places to find us. One is on Instagram. Uh, you can find me, Jody underscore Sperling. Um, and on our YouTube page, which is um, Jody Sperling slash Time Lapse Dance, and Time Lapse Dance is the name of uh, my company, we have full works up there. So there's like, you know, little snippets on Insta. And then you can, like, if you want to, like, sit down and watch a, a full show, you can, like, and you can also go to our website, which is timelapsedance.com. And you can find out about events that we have coming up or if you want to book us where you are, you know, we, we do shows, we do site activations and also you can screen um, our films. So, um, you know, get in touch with us. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. This has been this has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.